Hello everyone, and today we're going to be talking about what makes a great Mac application great. And this is going to be talking mainly about the platform as a whole, less about any particular framework. So I fundamentally think that Mac OS has different starting principles and different principles around the applications that are developed versus an iOS application. And I, I don't think that needs to necessarily be the case, but they fundamentally start from different places and therefore the applications that are created generally end up being different. And we'll kind of talk about the reasons that I think that's the case. But uh, with that said, this isn't about any type of framework, right? I don't really care if you're using Swift UI, Catalyst, AppKit, or really even Electron. I mean, in some ways I care, but the at the end of the day, right, if the user could not tell, you know, what framework you actually used and they all looked identical, then they really don't care that much, right? And that's kind of the fundamental idea for macOS that I like to get across is that there are certain expectations on the platform that you utilize as a user to better understand the platform. And of course, there's always ways that we can improve on this, but there are things that we've learned over the course of the history, right? Obviously, there's a long legacy with macOS, and that obviously comes with some negatives, but the positives are that there has been a lot of trial and error and different understandings of why we are where we are today. So with that said, um, let's just kind of get started on sort of some of these fundamental things that I think are part of macOS. So the first thing is keyboard control. Now keyboard control is fundamental to macOS, right? Unlike iOS, iOS started with the concept that you just touch the screen, right? There really was no expectation of an external keyboard. I don't even actually remember if it was supported out of the gate, but the point here, right, is that iOS starts with a touch interface, and that means that any application that's developed for iOS has that expectation. And the expectation with a keyboard in that case is that it's generally an exclusive or proposition, right? You're either touching the screen or you're gonna go into a text field and type something uh, using the, the on-screen keyboard, right? You're generally not using them in any kind of synergistic way. Uh, if we look at Mac OS, right, there's a fundamental difference here where it started with the keyboard. The keyboard is how Mac OS came about and it never really, I mean, that, that was the interface for the platform. Yes, the mouse is an addition to that and it's a wonderful addition, right? It makes the platform very easy for many people so that they can essentially use it as a touch interface, but um, they're, they're really synergistic with each other, right? The nice thing about the mouse is that you can click user interface elements, you can hover over user interface elements and discover aspects about the system that then you can actually transfer over to the keyboard, right? And that's kind of the goal almost with most Mac applications that you almost want to get to the point where you don't even really have to think about mouse movements. You can almost perform all of your actions just using the keyboard. And this can become extremely productive depending on the application that you're using. Again, obviously the mouse is very important here, but the point that I'm getting across is that they're fundamentally starting with the concept of a keyboard, right? Nobody's using a Mac without a keyboard, or at least I hope you're not because that would be very <laughs> unfortunate. Um, but basically everybody has a keyboard with their Mac. And so therefore it is a fundamental interface. Now, one of the cool things about macOS is that there's fundamental concepts around this idea, right? So if I go into any kind of system dialogue, right, any kind of alert that has a cancelability aspect to it, right? So in this case, I can cancel here for the system preference pane. And um, basically, if I want, I can hit, um, I don't actually have to move my mouse at all. I can just go up to the escape key or if it's a touch uh, bar, you can actually, it'll change to be a cancel button in this case. But that's the idea, right? Anything that maps to escape, I can hit escape and now I can cancel out of that modal dialog. And this is something that um, when applications don't do it, it kind of drives me crazy because the expectation in my mind at least is that I can always escape from some kind of modal context as long as there's no need to save some kind of state, right? So another example of this is in the Mac App Store, where if I go into one of these articles, and this actually wasn't always the case, earlier versions of this did not have the escape key, 
map to this. But the thing is, is that this is a totally modal dialog, right? And I really can't get back to the main page unless I'm hitting done in this, this case. And this done button does not map to saving any kind of state, right? It's really a dismissal. It's really a cancel in that case. And so I should just be able to hit the escape button. And luckily I can, and I use this all the time. Another case is in the photos application. Another application, and that's not photos, a photos application where um, this actually wasn't always the case as well. And so in the photos app, you can go into a, a photo. This is also, um, if you use finder, for example, you can hit command up to escape a folder. And that was actually always the case with photos is that you could hit command up and that would uh, dismiss you out of one up. Um, it recently, I. I don't even want to say that I added it, but I actually think I did add it, which was the escape uh, button on photos. So with photos, right, you can actually hit the escape key as well now when you're in one app, as long as there's no uh, transaction you need to commit, right? As long as it's just a cancelable state, essentially, and you're in a modal type situation, then hitting the escape key will also get you out of that condition, right? Now, one other thing that I want to point out is in system preferences here, where you can even take this keyboard concept even further, right? So uh, if you go into your keyboard and under the shortcuts tab, there's actually this option to use the keyboard to navigate between controls. And what this allows you to do is you can basically move the focus ring around to pick different elements and use the spacebar to activate them. So if I activate this option here, and I, this is actually what I use by default for myself, um, you can go into any kind of dialogue, and actually I could navigate to this whole thing if I wanted to just by using the keyboard, but um, what you can see here is that a nice little thing that happens is that when you're in system dialogues, you actually have the option now of this focus ring being around the controls. And if I hit tab, it'll cycle through all the elements that it can actually focus on. And what's really cool about this is that now I don't actually have to do anything with uh, the keyboard, right? I can just hit the space bar in this case, and now I've gone into activating that button. If I don't want to do this, I can still hit cancel to dismiss the alert, right? And so this is a wonderful kind of time saver, right? Is that I didn't actually have to move the mouse at all to go through that entire dialogue. I could operate that entire dialogue simply by hitting tabs, space bar, and then you know typing whatever I want. And that's a nice benefit with the keyboard, right? And this is something that because macOS derives all of its stuff from the keyboard, this is fundamental to how macOS works. Now, this is not to say that iPadOS, for example, could not become this, but the problem with iPadOS is it's coming from the different direction, right? It's coming from the only expectation really for the user is that they have an iPad and therefore they touch the screen. So for developers to actually incorporate into these aspects, they need to add these on. And the problem with that is that it's not, um, it's not the expectation, right? The user is not necessarily expected that any of these paradigms will exist, right? On Mac OS, it's different where we do expect these particular things to exist. So that's, that's one thing. Uh, the other things that I want to go through are how you basically use the mouse to explore the system as it is, and then how you can build upon that with the keyboard. So um, let's go over to an example here. Uh, I'll just go to Final Cut Pro as an example. And um, one sort of simple element that they have in here, and they don't do a great job necessarily with this, but you can hover over different items, and you'll notice that it will tell you what the item is doing, right? So um, you can select items with the select tool. And then at the end there, on that tooltip, they have A, which is telling you, hey, if you press the A key, you'll switch to this item. If you click on this, you'll actually get all these different uh, actions that you can do, but also the key that we'll use to um, actually you know, activate this, this item. So uh, if you hover over any of these, you can also get a better description of the, with the tooltip, right? It, gives you a better idea of what the action will do. But the key here really is that this little uh, character at the end is telling you, hey, you can hit T to switch to this immediately, right? So if you're new to this, using the mouse is great because I can just select different things, right? I never have to learn about the keyboard shortcuts, but after this gets old and you've used it for long enough, right? You can remember, okay, I'm on the zoom tool, but now I wanna select over 
and I can just hit that A key to switch over to that, that item. Another uh, place that does this quite well uh, is Pixelmator, and I'd actually argue they do it even better. Um, well, in some ways. So the, um, the difference here with, with Pixelmator is that, so let me just select one of these tools. If I hover over any of these items, it'll actually transition to show me what each one of the items does, which is a nice way of hiding all the text, but also allowing you to learn more about it if you sort of hover over it for a bit, brief second. The, no, the other nice thing about this is that they actually put all of their tools up in the menu bar. And this is um, an excellent way to discover the options that you have on Mac OS. So the, the reason I say that is because let's say I don't actually know where an option exists, right? I have no idea where the button is. And sometimes this can be difficult, right? I mean, these, these little buttons, uh, if you're, you know, if you, especially if you don't wait and hover over them and you're just looking at the interface, it can be difficult to understand what any of these do, right? And if I want to find something, I can go up to the help menu, type in the thing that I want to do, the action that I want to take, and then it'll show me where that menu item is. And as you can see, I'm basically learning more about the platform, right? Yes, I am just using the mouse right now to poke around, but it allows me to learn different aspects of what it is, right? So now I can learn, okay, paint is under the tools section. It's the B option, right? And the interface also kind of now points me to say, okay, if I hit B, I'm now on this tool, right? And that's where I'm going to end up. So this is part of the way that you can really learn on the platform. And I can't emphasize enough how important it is that your actions are in the toolbar. This is a really, uh, at least for me, it's a great way to understand all the options that I have available in the tool. And um, so the more, I mean, obviously it's not always, um, I mean, it, I guess it's mostly always possible, but it can be difficult to put things in a menu uh, bar if it's not kind of always available to you. So I kind of understand the impetus to not put things in there, but if you can, it is definitely a benefit to put tools that the user can use up in the menu bar so that they can discover them for themselves. The next thing I want to talk about is drag and drop. And this is also something that is sort of an expectation for Mac OS is that I should be able to anywhere that you could import an asset or import a folder or whatever it might be right into your application. The expectation is kind of that I should be able to drag and drop that same thing into your application as well, right? So whether it be onto the dock icon or directly into the uh, application itself. So in Pixelmator's case, I could drag an image onto Pixelmator, uh, the, the canvas, for example, and it would just automatically import that image, right? That is just a, f a good expectation for your app if you work with any of these particular assets. So whatever asset you work with, you really should accept them on as uh, drag and drop sort of acceptables. But also if your application holds its own assets, it is also an expectation that they should be able to export themselves, right? So drag out of your application into other contexts. So um, that's another great way you can improve upon your existing applications. Now, with this, there is a caveat here on macOS, which is kind of an unfortunate um, thing that we have, which is that we have the concept of file promises, and then the concept of sort of normal um, assets, so, so to speak. So this is unfortunate because that's just how the API developed over time and that later on we got file promises and many applications never really adopted file promises. And what a file promise is is the, basically the ability for an application to, to tell you, hey, I'm going to give you an asset. It's not really here yet because maybe it's on the cloud, for example, but I'll download it in the background. Here's the thing that you should accept at some point in time and then, you know, a second later or whatever. I will deliver the full asset to you and then you can fulfill that promise. So um, the downside for this is that many applications, like I said, have not done this. And one example of this is Slack. Now Slack isn't really a great example of a Mac application. I'd say they miss a lot of sort of standard Mac um, Macisms, but again, it's, you know, it's a generic application that a lot of people use. With that said, they could improve it. And so here's a great example of how they could do that which is uh, photos. So photos will uh, give you a file promise. Again, this is because your images might not necessarily be 
on disk, at least the full res image might not be on disk. And so to hand this image off to another application, we actually will uh, give you a, a warning, to tell you that the, the, the image itself isn't full resolution. And what that warning is actually telling you is, it's really a warning to the, the app developers um, to tell you, hey, um, you if you wanna accept a full resolution image, you need to actually use file promises to do this. And so um, the file promise is something that your application should accept. Cases where this works fine is, uh, well, many applications, but also on the system. So if I wanted to just drag this down into downloads, for example, right, I won't get a warning and it will deliver the full res image onto uh, the desktop or in that folder. The last thing I wanna talk about is automation. And this to me is kind of the, the mecca for Mac OS is the ability for you to essentially record an action that you might do manually and repeat it in code so that you don't actually have to do it anymore. A good example of this is um, I have um, a friend of mine that he wants to basically convert a document. So there's a CSV file that he would download every week. And normally he would just open numbers, delete a bunch of columns and rows and add some new things and highlight and functions, yada, 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 right? And this action would take probably five to 10 minutes. Now, his job is not to do this, right? His job is something else. And the cool thing about numbers at least and many other applications is that uh, numbers will provide a scripting ability such that you can access elements of what's in the document through code and the cool thing here is that you can basically do all these actions right you can delete rows add values etc all through an automated action right and because that's really what this entire thing was for it was to literally take an input right this file that he would download and convert that, give it a different output so that it would end up as a certain thing. And if you can script this whole action, you've just saved somebody, right? However, you know, amount of time that they would do over the course of them doing the rest of their business, right? And now instead of it taking 10 minutes a day or a week or whatever, now it just is, you know, less than a second or less than a minute rather to download the file, drop it on an automator action and you get the output. So that's the cool thing that you can do with automator actions or scriptability in your applications in general. Another cool thing that macOS has is the ability to add actions on existing applications, right? So here's an example of a workflow that I actually use myself, uh, specifically with Xcode. And it's very simple. It's really just running a shell script that simply sorts text in alphabetical order and then uniques it so that if there's any duplicates, it will get rid of any duplicates. And um, a good example of this, right, is if, um, so I'm gonna switch over to text edit, right? And this action is defined system-wide for anything that has text input, right? And I can select this text and I can right click it, go down to services, sort and unique. And when I do that, it will perform that action, right? It sorts the text and uniques it. If there were any duplicates, it'll throw them out. And I do this all the time, right? I, it's a very common action that I do, but I've just extended the system so that I can perform this on any type of text field, right? And there's great power in this, right? And this is something that I certainly don't wanna lose from Mac OS. And I'm actually gonna talk in some future videos about how you can add automator uh, actions or scriptability to your Mac applications, because I think it's something that probably is lacking some kind of good, decent video or documentation on how to do it. And uh, I just kind of hope that people can find the joy, at least that I find, with um, scriptability in their applications. So anyway, that's all I have for uh, this video, but I hope uh, you can at least see the passion that I have for uh, keeping macOS uh, the, the great platform that it is. And I hope that um, you can take away some of these tools and tips for improving your own applications and keeping uh, platforms doing great positive things in the future. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe to the channel, give this video a like, and share it with your friends. Ways to contribute and additional information are in the description. I'll see you next week.